do you feel like the process of studying songwriting academically like that like limits you creatively at all or enhances it? It has made me a much better songwriter. I remember the first time, or like when I first started going to boarding school for songwriting, I was there and for like the first three months that I was there, I didn't write a song. It's because I was having this like method drilled into me and my songwriting teacher was always like, it'll become a subconscious thing. Because once you know the rules, you can break them better. You can use them to your advantage. Hi, I'm Kelly, and I am here with Gabby Gamberg, otherwise known as Daffo. So great to have you here. Thanks for having me. Now, my first question, I'm curious, where did the name Daffo come from? Growing up, um, my front yard was always like covered in daffodils. Mm -hmm. And my mom, who's just a lovely hippie lady, I love her. Every time we would pull out of the driveway, she'd be like, can you hear the daffodils singing? Like, the daffodils are singing. And I also think that my sister wanted to name me Daffodil, mm. and my mom was like, we don't want her to be called Daffy, like the duck. <laughs> anyway, I've always had like kind of a strong connection to Daffodils, and when I first started writing music, or when I first started seriously writing music, I guess, um, I really wanted to be called Dear Daffodil. Mm. But um, I don't know, I wanted to switch from Gabby Gamberg. I didn't really like having my name be a thing I don't know, I liked it to be my name and only my name. Um, so I just, you know, did what any person would do and wrote down a bunch of options and went with DAFO. Do you consider DAFO like your project or is it like the band as a whole? Both. Um, I've always kind of wanted it to just be like a band situation, but I've been like moving around so much and my bandmates have been switching around so much that it's just kind of, it hasn't been like a solidified group yet. I would like it for it to be one day, so. Um, but I mean, yeah, if I play a solo show, I still am Daffo. It's just kind of the name of the project, I guess, yeah. And who else plays the project with you right now? Um, so my friend Jonah is playing synth, my friend Sam plays bass and sings, my sister's boyfriend Justin plays drums right now. Um, I've had so many different drummers, <laughs> but, um, and then Nat, Natalie Musher is on guitar right now. Um, I used to play a ton with uh, Hudson Pollock, who produced um, Crisis Kit and produced this EP that's coming out on October 20th. Um, so whenever they're here, we, we play together. But um, yeah, that's who I have right now. And it switches, uh, it switches out a lot. It's like a lot of my friends are already playing in other bands. They'll have a show. I have to get somebody else. So. I don't know. It is what it is. But I'm, I'm happy with my, my friends. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you guys sound great together. Thank you. <laughs> do you write it all yourself or do you write it as a collective? I write it myself. Awesome. Definitely um, different like guitar parts, synth parts, um, drum parts, like everything when we come together and we rehearse, we're all kind of like figuring out what sounds good. Um, but yeah, the songs I write myself. Yeah. And how long have you been writing for? That's a like hard question. Every time somebody asks me that, I pull up this video of myself and I'm like three and I'm like singing a song I made up, like it's nonsense words. But like, I don't really have a specific period of time where I feel like I started writing songs. I feel like I was always making up songs. Um, I think I started playing guitar when I was around like eight or nine. And as soon as I started playing guitar, I was writing songs. So maybe then, but like seriously, I was probably like, 14. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That was around my timeline as yeah. well, actually. That's awesome. Yeah. The first song that I ever heard of yours was The Experiment. Um, I think you're calling, well, you originally were calling it The Slit Experiment, right? Yes. Yeah. Why did you change the name? Um, I was like, if people Google The Slit Experiment, they're going to get, get The real Slit Experiment. experiment. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, and also just, it's, it's more than just about The Slit Experiment. I'm like fascinated by The Slit Experiment. My father's a physicist. So like, I've always been really into physics. Um, in, in a very spiritual way. Mm. Um, but yeah, I just thought the experiment had a snappier ring to it. I don't know, yeah. You said you wrote that one in your sleep? Yes. <laughs> I had like a really restless sleep. Um, and I woke up and I was like still like half asleep. You know when you're like awake and you're like mm -hmm. half asleep? And I literally, like I still have a piece of paper. I just like nonstop was just like, I, I woke up with the song in my head, like the da 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 it was like stuck in my head. I don't know where, it probably is like a different song. So don't, don't look into it. But um, it was stuck in my head and I just like wrote it all down, picked up the guitar. First chord I played was like a C and it was just like there. I mean, 
yeah. So, I, you know, I wasn't asleep. And then, like, but I was asleep. It was in my head. And then I, like, woke up, wrote it all down. And I was like, okay, this is, this is the song. Yeah. Was it just the melody that was in your head or the lyrics, too? Both. Mm. It was weird. Like, how much of the lyrics? I don't know. Like, I had, I'm a particle, but I'm also a wave. Like, I had that. And then when I woke up and, like, tried to write it down, I just, like, couldn't stop. And then it just kept, like, rhyming dumb shit. And I was like, I was pissed off. I was like having like a shitty day before, so I don't know. Writing about quantum physics in your sleep <laughs> and also using the word pluviophile in your sleep. Pluviophile. That's such a flex. <laughs> like, yeah. That's really impressive. I think I like just heard that word the other day and like, I don't know. It was just like a, just like a soup in my brain and I just kind of like barfed it out, which happens sometimes. It does happen to me where I just kind of like barf out a song, but... Yeah. That makes sense with your dad being a physicist that that was like yeah. moving around in your brain a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and I, I meditate a lot. I do transcendental meditation. And like, I feel like I'm, I'm not a religious person, but I'm a very spiritual person. And I think like a lot of that kind of ties into like science and physics because yeah. it's like really like there's so much that we don't know. And so it's like, for me, I just find it very fascinating and I find it to be like proof for me. But it's like, you know. Yeah. The world is strange. I really latched onto that, the concept of the duality there in yeah. that song in general. Yeah. I think when you said um, the song makes no sense, it, when, uh, that was the first video I ever saw of yours. So the first thing I saw yeah. that popped up was you saying you wrote it in your sleep and the song makes no sense. But I feel like it, it absolutely does it make sense. It makes sense in the way that it doesn't make sense. I think like, um, I don't know, like there, a lot of the lyrics are very random. Um, so I feel like that's that's kind of what I was saying. but. You know, yeah. But still, know. like, I feel like that... That was my whole... main thing. People, I think maybe that's the only reason people engaged was because they were like, mm. no, this makes sense. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Thanks Fine, for the comment. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I feel yeah. like a lot of that, like, subconscious style writing can feel that way. Like, it, it doesn't make sense when you look back and actually read through it. It yeah. is all interconnected. It's all your real thoughts. Do you find that your writing is often, like, a subconscious thing like that? Yeah. A lot of the time, I won't know what a song is about until after I've written it. Um... It's really interesting, like, I've been in relationships where I've written songs, and then, like, after the relationship is over, I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, that's, that's how I was actually feeling, and, like, I didn't realize it until I, like, it's like my subconscious and my songs know a lot more before mm -hmm. I do, um, so it's really interesting, yeah. Do you feel like it's like a channel for you to get things out? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the same way that I feel like it's a, it's a mechanism for anybody who writes songs to just kind of, like, uh, for me, it's I, I figure out how I'm feeling through my songs. It's I, I don't often sit down thinking like, I feel this way, I'm going to write a song about it. I kind of sit down and like, I play a chord and it feels good to me. And then like, sometimes I'll start with a line and it all just kind of like, I'll be like, oh, this is interesting. And then I'll like roll with that idea and probably like to more of an extreme than like it actually is. Then I'll go back and I'll like make it make a little bit more sense. And I'll be like, oh, I, I, this, is, this is an exaggeration. I don't actually feel this way. Like, I don't actually hate this person. I don't actually, like, I'm not in love with this person. I'm not, like, or, like, I don't know. I don't hate myself this much. And then I'm like, oh. Months later, it's like, oh, yeah. actually, that's exactly yeah. how I feel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you do a lot of revision when you write? Um, I didn't used to. I think Crisis Kit is a good example of that. I think, personally, I know a lot of people love that EP, but it does not make sense to me. Mm -hmm. I think... Now I try to let myself write like without editing and then I do go back and I'm like there's a better way to say this there's a better like syllable count here like I went to an art sporting high school for songwriting and like I study songwriting in school now and so like I do have a very like there is like a scientific method behind it that I do kind of like to apply because it just makes everything a little more catchy um, but yeah I definitely do now I go back and I edit for sure. Do you feel like the process of studying songwriting academically like that like limits you creatively at all or enhances it? Um, it has made me a much better songwriter. Um, just like point blank, it has. Um, I remember the first time, or like when I first started going to boarding school for songwriting, um, I was like about to drop out of public high school. I was like, I hate this. Like I really cannot be here. And I Googled songwriting high school and like went to the first place on the list. So uh, my parents loved that. 
Um, and I was there and for like the first three months that I was there, I didn't write a song. And I used to write a song like every week, every other week. I was just like, it was all coming out of me. And I couldn't write a song. Like I really just could not write a song for three months because I was having this like method drilled into me. And my songwriting teacher was always like, it'll become a subconscious thing. It'll become just like, because once you know the rules, you can break them better. You can use them to your advantage. And I, I really do like how like scientific mm -hmm. it is. Like there's a yeah. way to like make a certain section stand out. There's a way to make, uh, to use chords to like make a certain thing feel a certain way. Um, and I mean, I, I would be lying if I said like, I, you know, sit down and I really think about how the song is gonna be and I structure it all out because most of the time I'm just barfing it out. Mm, yeah. But um, it definitely helps with revision and just like, if I'm wondering like, why isn't this as good as it could be? It, it's just, a def it's definitely like a good thing to have my back pocket. Right, yeah, I think it's important to learn how to be intentional. If yeah. you have that initial creative thing that you could just kind of roll with and then also apply some intentionality to that afterwards, that's I think when you get like a really well-informed product. Yeah. That's super cool. Yeah. Um, if you were writing a song like right now, from start to finish, like what would your entire process be like? Like what does it look like for you? I would pick up a guitar, I would find a chord that I like, I would find another chord that I like, I would come up with a line or just kind of, a lot of my lyrics are informed by just like whatever comes out of my mouth in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, Cause like syllable count and like all of that, just melody, just kind of like the melody and like the chords it informs the lyrics for me. Mm. Um, and I think that also comes out of my subconscious. Right. Um, yeah. Is that like simultaneous for you? Like you sing a melody as you sing lyrics? Yeah, I don't. Um, it's rare that I'll like write chords and then later write lyrics or like write lyrics and later write chords. I'm, I'm definitely a kind of person that would just, I do it at the same time. I just kind of like form the song as I go. Yeah. I saw a few of yours where you sang placeholder lyrics or something about a dog. Yeah. <laughs> um, which didn't sound like placeholder lyrics I played lyrics that to last me. night. It was actually really sick. It was really fun. So yeah. did those end up being the lyrics that you actually used at the end? I think I did go back and edit them a little bit. Um, I think it's a fun song. I think I also have another song that's very similar to that that also goes into a different time signature that I also love. And it just feels like they're the same song with different lyrics. Um, so I, I, I have a lot of songs lost that way. Like I mm. write songs and I'm like, it sounds exactly like this other song that I write, that I wrote. And then I'm like, this one's better. And I keep this one and I like lose the other one. You know, not every song has to be that deep. It is just kind of about a dog. I had, it is kind of about my dog, Sparky, who died. Mm. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, don't be sorry. <laughs> I don't know, I'm laughing. He died like uh, a little over a year ago and he was just an old dog. And I was just thinking about his life, about how like all he did was sit there and his life was the same every single day. And that's how I was feeling at the time. I was just mm -hmm. like, cause the lyrics were like, here boy, drop mm -hmm. it, good boy, fetch it. And I felt like that's what I was doing every day. I felt like I was just like, it was the same thing over and over again. So I guess it does have a deeper meaning now that I'm thinking yeah. about it. But yeah, I don't know. The lyrics are pretty much the same. That was a long winded answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like your creativity is like very consistent or does it come in spurts? So like, Do you write? Are you the type of person who can like write every day or do you not write for multiple months and all of a sudden you have six songs in a week? Like yeah, um, it's, there are definitely times that I'm writing every day, every week. Um, and there are definitely times when I can't seem to write a song um, and I keep writing the same thing over and over again. And I think in those times, it's really important for me to like listen to music and to like record and to consume as much as I can so that when I finally feel ready and when I am inspired, I have like a new vocabulary. Um, yeah, that's what I try to do. Most of the time I just sulk <laughs> and I'm like, God, I'm never gonna write a song again. Um, I always feel that way. I'm always like, I'm never gonna write a song again. And I do, um, luckily one day it, it might run out. The tap might run the out. The well run see. dry. <laughs> yeah. um, I fear that day. That's my biggest fear. Um, that, like, one of my biggest fears. There's always new things to yeah. be inspired by. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I do, it comes in waves and I try to be the kind of songwriter that can write when I'm not inspired. Yeah. And I can, I just never end up liking those songs. Yeah, I agree. 
Um, <laughs> a lot of those songs are usually like for school. They're like write a pop. Like I can write a good pop song any day. Like I, you know, I have I have yeah, yeah. that toolbox. You know. Um, what kinds of things do inspire you? Uh, my feelings <laughs> and emotions um, and uh, weird imagery that I notice. A lot of like my first lines come from like something that I notice. Mm -hmm. um, like I was just thinking about this person that I was hooking up with and how they always have all this junk on their bed. And I was like, every time I go to their place, they always have to like push all of the junk off of their bed. And so I'm like, that could be a line. Like it's, it's weird. It's just like stuff like that that I notice. And then that kind of spills out into its own thing. It could like go many directions, but I just kind of let it be what it is. Do you write those observations down when you have them and then revisit them later? Sometimes, yeah. It's always like the first line. Mm. Yeah. What about what about sonically? Like, what are some things that inspire you that you listen to? I mean, I feel like every time I'm asked this question, I, I give the same old basic answers. Just love like Alex G, mm -hmm. Slater Kinney, yeah. Big Thief. Like, I'm very like into like the indie rock, the folk of today. Um, yeah, I don't know. I love guitar music. I love Nick Drake. I love Elliot mm. Smith. Nick Drake. Yeah. Nick Drake is so good. I mean, all these people that you listen to are yeah. really incredible. Uh, especially the, the Big Thief, Adrian Linker thing. I know a lot of people specifically compare you to them a lot. Um, do you, how do you feel about that? I mean, obviously, I think Adrian Linker is one of the best songwriters writing right now. I know, so I, too. it's a huge compliment. It's a huge compliment. But I think still. it's a huge compliment. I think, I feel like if I felt like I was ripping her off more, which of course I am a little bit, you know, I'm inspired by we her. All I love each other her. I listen to her. Um, I feel like I would be more worried about it and I feel like that would be my own internalized like problem with myself mm -hmm. like I am completely honored like she's my favorite songwriter of all time I have never felt that way about a songwriter and to be compared to one of your favorite songwriters is like yeah. huge it's like I don't know I'm like I when I first saw those like comments on TikTok like this is Big Thief this is Adrian Laker I'm like Okay, <laughs> like, right, okay, you thank so. you. And I also, like, I know myself. I know that I, you know, I have a unique sound, and I know that, like, you know, I think a lot of the comparison comes from my voice. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of vocal flips. That's just, like, always been the way that I've sung. I've had, like, uh, I had one voice teacher ever, and she was like, why do you keep doing that? And I'm like, what? And she was like, listen back to this. And I was like, what? And she was like, this. And she had to, like, narrow it down. And I was like, oh. I don't know, like, and then I kind of started listening to like Angel Olsen and mm -hmm. Big Thief and Buck yeah. Meek, and I started realizing that like, I can use it to my advantage. And I think that they taught me how to use it, but that's always been kind of a part of my voice, so. I think it's a really cool sound and yeah. a very unique one that not a lot of people have. Um, I, I obviously understand why people are drawing those parallels there. Um, and to think that you could be giving people a similar feeling as like Adrian Linker's music gives you. I that's... don't know. It's, it's really strange to me and it, it feels great because that's all I could ever hope for is to like have that same effect on somebody. So yeah. why, why do you perform and why do you write? Oh, big question. Those are big questions. I have always performed. I like when I was a kid, I did dance and I did theater. And then when I got older, I was like a hardcore ballerina and I wow. did theater. I, you know, I was a little bit of a theater kid. I'm like, yes, well. it took me a while to, yeah, and you have to be. You know. It's a prerequisite. It, yeah, it's a prerequisite. Um, you kind of, playing my songs on stage for the first time was difficult because it literally is the most personal shit ever. Yeah. And when I was growing up, my sisters used to find my songwriting journals and like traumatize me, come up to me, open them and start reciting my lyrics oh, back to me. And so it took me a while. It took me until I was like 15 to actually perform my songs. Um, yeah, I love performing. I just, I don't know why. I think I feel very connected to people. I think it's a chance for me to like, I, I talk a lot and it's not always appropriate. And I think it gives me a space to communicate these like giant things that I feel. Cause I feel like I feel just like very, very deeply. Um, and then why do I write? Was that the other question? Yeah. I have to. I, I, again, like when you were asking me, when did I start writing songs? Like, I feel like 
once I discovered that I could actually do it in a format, I did not stop. Like I, I was writing, I, when I was younger, I used to write way more than I do now. Mm. Like when I was like 15, 16, like I used to write two songs a week. I was like prolific. It was crazy. And I missed that. Um, not everything was good, but I was at that point in my life was also probably the hardest time in my life. Mm. And I think I don't know what I would do if I wasn't writing. It's kind of like, I don't know, it's an outlet. What, what else can you say? Um, yeah, I need to. I don't know. And when I'm not writing, I feel horrible. So, yeah, I don't know. Do you ever feel like something you've written is too honest? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. Uh, it's, but I think it's also good art. Yeah. And so I feel like I have a duty to overshare. <laughs> and I love to overshare. Um, I think it's funny. <laughs> I it honestly is, it just is. think it's funny. And I think I think when people are really honest, I think it grabs people's attention more. And I think people feel less alone when other people yeah. are more honest. And obviously, I don't have to be talking about all the explicit sex stuff that I talk about, but I think it's funny and I think it makes for a good song and it makes for good memorable lyrics. Um, yeah. Yeah, I really connected with your authenticity. Like I feel like your writing is very vulnerable in a way that I don't see a lot of people uh, being. I, I think a lot of people like hide behind a specific aesthetic and yeah. it feels like it does, when I listen to the things you write, it feels like it's like, coming from coming straight from your brain it's, it's that ADHD really, yeah. and it's that uh total trauma of being told to shut the fuck up my whole life that like made me one day I like flipped a switch and I was like I do not care mm. like this is what I have this is what I'm gonna say and if you don't like it you're probably boring so leave <laughs> me alone like I don't know I'm very fed up with people that are just like you're weird, you talk too much. And mm -hmm. it's like, okay, yeah, like sometimes I talk too much and need to let you talk and that's important. But like, I don't know. Can you hold a conversation? Probably not. Like, <laughs> probably not. I can. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I saw you put out a song about having ADHD the other day. I think it's cool to like open a dialogue about stuff like that and, you know, to be honest in that way. Yeah. Do you feel like it affects your, your performance or the way that you write? Yeah, definitely. I think it's a huge piece of me and I wasn't diagnosed until like two years ago and I knew I had it my whole life. I, no shade on my mother, I love my mother. She did not want me to get diagnosed because um, she was very worried that I would start taking medication and like it would just have a negative effect on me. Um, but I think that uh, once I like fully understood that I had ADHD, I kind of understood where a lot of my shame came from and where a lot of my self-hatred came from mm -hmm. because being neurodivergent in this world is not easy and it's not uh, well-liked. I was not yeah. well-liked in like middle school and like early high school um, because I talked too much and because I was loud um, and I had like this deep guilt and shame about it. And like, even in school, it's like I wasn't doing my homework but I would still get mm -hmm. A's and right. like, yeah, it's, it's really, it was, I was very messy and I was very loud and I hated myself for it. And then once I got that diagnosis, I think it helped me to understand that I was really just like holding on to all this shame. And I feel like the EP that's about to come out is like a product of that. It's mm. like very much so like self-pity and shame and like working through that. Um, I mean, it's called Pest. So my yeah. mom was like, why are you calling it Pest? Like, don't you love yourself? And I'm like, <laughs> Sorry to tell you. <laughs> Dear sweet mother. <laughs> yeah, I love you. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's really, really important to be able to channel those types of feelings about yourself into art specifically. Yeah. And then to put that out and to have other people see that who feel similarly about themselves. It's really, really important. Yeah. Even people who aren't neurodivergent. Yeah. Like, I think because uh, neurodivergent people, like, typically, like, the, a lot of people that I know, and especially people with ADHD, I like we feel so deeply. Mm -hmm. Like I feel things like to the max, and I think my ability to do that also opens a door for people who like are neurotypical to like yeah. 
access that emotion. Not not that like neurotypical people are don't feel right, deeply, right, right. but you know. It's still, yeah, I've had experiences where I've said something in a song that people have then said they've never heard it verbalized, but they've yeah, thought that. Yeah. Yeah, it's important for people to hear their own emotions like reflected back at them yeah. that way. And I like I'm happy to be able to do that. And I like hope that it helps people. I hope that it's not all a selfish act because I love doing it. Um, but yeah. I don't think it's a selfish act at all. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> do you still feel connected to things that you wrote a long time ago? Like Poor Madeline? I know you wrote that when you were 17. That song specifically right now is, I am a lot less connected to it than I was, mm. I think because I've heard it way too many times. Right. I've been playing it for over two years and the recording process was brutal. I was trying to get it right. A lot of people had a lot of demands on like how they wanted it to sound. And eventually I kind of leaned into how I liked it live um, mm. because that's, I was playing it live like that way before people heard the acoustic version on TikTok. Mm -hmm. um, but I do, I do definitely feel connected to that because I think that I have a lot of empathy for my younger self. And I think that I definitely deserve to give myself more love back then. And um, when I hear these songs, sometimes I'm like, it pains me. Yeah. And, um, but I also am like really proud of myself for like doing that and not tons of drugs or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Why did you choose to sit on it for so long instead of releasing it? The CP? Yeah, or specifically Poor Madeline, but all of it. You have a lot of unreleased stuff. Oh yeah. Um, the time was never right. I couldn't, I didn't have the, I think I have uh, such high expectations for how I want things to sound. Mm. And I didn't really have the opportunity to make the songs sound the way that I wanted them to sound until recently. Um, I think that's, that's pretty much it. And I think I am very picky about what I put out and what I think is good enough. And I know that a lot of people really like my demos and really like my rougher songs, but I don't know. I'm just slowly being very careful and putting out what I, what I want people to hear and in the way that I want them to hear it. I don't want to rush anything because I feel like, especially with TikTok, everybody's like, oh, put it out now, yeah, put it out yeah. now. And I'm like, give me a minute. Yeah. It takes time. Yeah. I don't have the right guitar tone. I don't have the right guitar. I don't know. So, yeah. Do you I keep like, saying so, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Do you feel like you have like a, a sound that you're hearing in your head when you write, like the full version of the song that you're trying to then recreate out loud? A lot of people say that they have that. I don't. Hmm. I have to try things and I have to see what sounds good. And a lot of that comes from playing live um, and just how the song develops over time. Like sometimes lines will change and sometimes like a guitar line will change or somebody in my band will write a line that I love. Um, and I, when I'm recording and I'm like, it, it's missing that feeling. And I realize it's because playing it live, I was, you know, using a different pedal or mm -hmm. I was doing something else. So it comes from a lot of trial and error for me. I don't have that. I'm really bad at like picturing a whole thing. Mm -hmm. I definitely go piece by piece. I think that's, that's a good approach to it though. Yeah. I wish I had one of those minds that was like, I can hear the synthesizer and the violin stuff, but I don't. But that can also be a little bit of a curse, too, because yeah. if you're going after something that doesn't exist, you know, yeah. it can be hard to then yeah. translate that into real life. I'm sure. Uh, I know you said about poor Madeline that you will never write anything better. Do you really believe that? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't believe that. I think I have written many things that are better than poor Madeline. I, do, I did feel that way for a while. I think it is one of my best songs. Um, but, you know, it's not like I'm going on TikTok and thinking and not thinking about what's going to make people watch the video. Right. I, as somebody with ADHD, like, I am very good at analyzing what people are drawn to mm -hmm. and, like, what people like to hear. And what I noticed, I actually learned this from the Slit Experiment video, was that uh, I wrote this in my sleep and it makes no sense. And I truly believed that. And then the reason I got so much inter so many interactions were like, yeah, this makes sense. Like people were like, no. Right. And so by me saying, I'm never gonna write anything better, maybe somebody is gonna say, yes, you will. Of course you will. What are you talking about? Or this sucks. That's engagement. That yeah. works for me. It definitely worked for me. So um, yeah, there was definitely a time when I thought that song was the best thing that I'd ever written, but I 
think I have written better. I mean, I was 17, yeah. and I have more. I have more to a say. A little bit more life experience now. I yeah. mean, I am very young, and I don't know. I hope to just keep getting better. I don't want to reach a point where I stop. I've also seen you put out uh, videos like for album or song promo stuff. It's like you eating a bagel, the live photo of yeah. you eating a bagel. I just thought that video was really funny. <laughs> it is funny. It is funny. I think it's interesting that you talk, you're talking about um, like ways to grab people's attention like that. Like, what's your approach to album or song promo? Or like, how do you get yourself in like the promo mindset? It can be really weird. I think it's. Um, I hated the idea of TikTok, and I didn't have it until I got it to start posting about my music. And then the second thing I posted blew up out of nowhere. I wasn't thinking about it. And I feel like I just got really lucky. And then there was like a, about like three weeks there where I was thinking really hard about it. Like, what do I have to post? When do I have to post? What time of day do I have to post? Mm -hmm. And then I remembered how much I didn't give a shit at all <laughs> in the beginning. And I was like, oh, f that. I think the reason people like what I'm doing is because I don't give a shit. And like, I just want to be... I don't know, I'm just like, I just think it was funny. Like, if something amuses me, I'm just going to post it. And, you know, uh, like the bagel video obviously didn't get that many right. likes, but I <laughs> liked it. So. I liked it, it was funny. <laughs> yeah, so, I don't know. I think I don't want to lie to anybody about who I am. Um, and I'm not good at that, so. Yeah, you shouldn't be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was it like for you to have your stuff blow up on TikTok like that? Like, what, did it feel sudden? Yeah, it was the day before my... 19th birthday mm -hmm. um, and I had just shaved my head and everything was changing. I had just changed my name to Daffo and I literally wake up the next day, it's my birthday and I'm like, what the f is going on? This is stupid. This is really funny. And then I was like, oh no, I have to keep doing this. Like it became a huge pressure mm -hmm. and it was weird, and I started getting recognized, and people on dating apps were like, I know you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, never again. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> Stay away. <laughs> so it's, it was definitely an adjustment, and I, I didn't like it, and, but I was grateful for it. Um, and obviously, I, I don't think I would even be in this room with you if I didn't blow up on TikTok. So I, I got TikTok at a time when I had enough people coming to my shows and I was like, I don't know, I could keep doing this. I don't think I'm going to grow anymore. I was at a point where I didn't think I was going to grow much more if I didn't start, you know, doing what the music industry demands. Um, yeah, it's a strange thing. Uh, a lot of times I don't, I don't want to be like putting unfinished things on TikTok. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be showing people every single aspect of my life. But at the same time, I am an overshare. I do like to tell people everything that's going on. It's just strange that it's strangers. Yeah. Um, and I think it's interesting to have people who feel like they know me. Right. And I have no clue who they are. The whole parasocial thing, yeah. And it's interesting because I, like, there are people that make music that I feel like I know. Right. But, you know, it's interesting to be in the opposite space. And... Um, I'm just trying to kind of observe and remain calm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's all you can do. Yeah. And when you're putting stuff out that's so personal, too, I understand why people feel like they're connected to you. I mean, the worst part is my parents. I mm. just don't want them listening or hearing the yeah. stuff that I say. But um, they're chill. They've always been chill. I think, I think they're glad that I'm making art. How do you like push past the embarrassment aspect of having people in your own personal life hear your actual thoughts and feelings? <laughs> I have been, I don't really get embarrassed easily mm. anymore. I think what I was saying earlier about just like how much I like put pressure on myself to be a certain way for so long, like in middle school, like when I was younger, like I got to a point where I was just like, get like, people can like me or they cannot like me and like wasting my time thinking about that is a waste of time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking more of TikTok, <laughs> you hashtag a lot of your videos with the hashtag punk. Do you, is that like a label you identify with? And like, what does it, what does it mean to you? Um, it was definitely something that I wasn't super tuned into before I started playing shows. I think I would write a lot of folk songs and then I would 
get together with my band and it would come out sounding like punk music. Mm. And it was kind of a label that was pushed onto me a little bit. Not pushed. I mean, I was happy to receive it. Mm. But I've always loved like Riot Girl. Like mm-hmm. I yeah. love Slater Kinney. I love Bikini Kill. And I love the mentality of punk. It's super community based. Yeah. And that's the kind of musician that I want to be. I don't know how much I can claim that label because I, I think I fall more under like the grunge mm-hmm. label. But um, I think when I put out a song on TikTok that has the hashtag punk, I think it's because it's a punk song. <laughs> um, it has that vibe. It has that uh, cadence to it and that kind of get mentality, I guess. I feel like you cover a lot of genres, though. Like, you, I feel, you can see you playing harmonica and the fiddle, and then you're, like, screaming in yeah. the next song, which is so cool. I feel like there's, like, an axis of intense music that exists, and you could be quietly intense all the way up to, like, loud screaming, and the same group of people is kind of drawn to everything along that line. I feel, I think you represent, like, that whole spectrum super, super well. I think Thank it's you. really, really cool. How would you, like, distill yourself for someone who hasn't heard you before? Sometimes I say I am a folk musician with a grunge band behind me. Mm, That's that's how I like to say it. Um, Your EP. Let's talk about your EP. (laughs) You have an EP coming out on the 20th called Pest, as you mentioned. I would love to hear you talk about that recording process, who's involved with you, um, things you learned along the way, who produced it, you know. So... Same person that produced Crisis Kit is my best friend in the whole world, Hudson. We met when we were 15, and we've been, like, inseparable since then. And um, I basically have been saying that this EP is going to come out. Like, every every, I released Crisis Kit, and then I was like, next EP, end of this summer. And then I was like, "Mm, in the the fall, in the winter. And it was just kind of, like, I kept pushing it, and eventually... And I didn't know if Hudson and I were going to work together again because I was like, maybe I should branch out. Or, like, Hudson is working on, like, the Quinny stuff right now. Oh, cool. Um, and is, yeah, is doing a lot of stuff out in L.A. and I'm in New York. And I think we finally came to the decision that we were, like, going to make it together because I tried some stuff with other producers who were great, but it wasn't right. Mm-hmm. And it's really rare, I feel like, to have somebody that gets your music. Yeah. Um, probably because we grew up together. Um But, yeah, I flew out to L.A., and I was going to stay there for two weeks, and that turned into three weeks, and that turned into a month Mm. of us sitting in Hudson's one-room studio apartment, uh, desk in the corner, bed over here, couch over there, and, like, recording as much as we could. There are so many different versions of Poor Madeline, so many different versions of, like, Good God and everything like that. Um, And... Then I came back, and there were some things I had to do in New York and send over. And then my other friend, Jake Weinberg, um, who works with Hudson a lot, um, was helping us mix it and do some additional production. And it's been this kind of, like, stressful, like, we're on either coast kind Mm -hmm. of, like, sending things back and forth. And there's the frustration of, like, not being in the same room. And then there was that time crunch when we were in L.A. together. There was a moment when I was, like, We made the first version of Poor Madeline, and I started sobbing because it was not good. Mm. It was fine, but it was just not right. And I was like, this isn't it. Like, we're not going to be able to make this EP. It was the first thing we worked on. And then we went on a drive. We, like, got some food. We came back, and we were like, let's work on a different song. And we started working on Collector, and it was just so good. Mm. I love that song. I think it's great. I think the recording is perfect, exactly how I wanted it. And in that moment, I was like, okay, we can move on, we can move forward. But it was just, um, I don't know, it was very, like, just me and my friends trying to make the songs come to life. And um, I don't know how much more there is to it. I mean, we it, we were recording at home, so, like, recording mm-hmm. aspect. We used a lot of 441 on my vocal. Mm-hmm. Um, we did, some of, the, some of the guitars are DI, Um, And, like, Mm. reamped. And I played mostly on Hudson's uh, Jazz Master. And, yeah, like, basically everything was on a 441. And then an AKG. Those um, uh, condenser (laughs) mics, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
was like those two mics. And then when we recorded drums, I was in the room for that. Um, I'm not super, I'm not a super expert on that, but I was in there. We were working on the drum parts together. We kind of just like listened to everything. Um, we were in Jake's studio for that. And yeah, we just kind of did it piece by piece. We were supposed to get it done by the end of the summer. Poor Madeline came out September and we actually just finished one of the songs like three days ago. Oh man. <laughs> um, we were really pushing it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. We really just wanted it to come out, especially before the holiday season. I don't want it to be all mm. mushed in with all the Christmas, Christmas music. Um, it's definitely not that. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I don't know. It was just kind of like friends working on music together, trying to make it happen. That's the best way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> How many tracks is it? It's six. So it goes Collector, Good God, Poor Madeline is included, Seed, a song called Complete Circle, which mm. I love, and then a bonus track, it's a secret. Ooh, fun. I can tell you after this. But. Yeah, please do. <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've been leaking a lot of leaking, a lot of those leaking. songs. <laughs> uh, do you feel like that like affects it for you? Because a lot of them people aren't hearing for the first time. Um, no, I think it's fun. It I think fun. it's like, I'm just being a tease. And um, I want people to be excited about the music and I want people to stay engaged and like not lose interest and know that it's still coming. Um, I also just like get excited about the music and I'm like, I want to share it and mm -hmm. I wish it was out right now. And so I like share a piece of it and I just like hope people get excited. Um, yeah, honestly, I'm just really impatient and really excited to share. And, you know, I don't think I'm like a big enough musician that it really matters that I'm like leaking pieces of my music. Um, it's just fun. Yeah, I think it's a great way to get people excited about what you're doing. Did the Madeline books inspire poor Madeline? Um, I think I knew what I was writing about. And I was thinking a lot about the books because I had been moving around a lot. And I just went to boarding school. And I had been like, I don't know, I didn't have any of my things anywhere. And I just felt very lonely. And I've always identified with her. Um, I'm also terrified of appendicitis, so like it's oh, it's just like ingrained in my brain. Like I would read that book and be like, oh my god, I'm gonna get appendicitis and die. Um, just like, you know, anxiety, all that jazz. <laughs> Not inspired by, but stolen from. Mm. Yeah, influenced. Like I, I used the name because I thought it was fitting because I knew what I was writing about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Cool. <laughs> What what are your plans now that the EP is coming out? Like, what are you doing post EP? Maybe I'm going on tour. That would be fun. I'm in school. I don't want to be in school. Um, I'm writing songs. I'm playing shows. I guess we'll see how it's received. I want to sign a record deal. <laughs> um, so maybe I can move to LA and be out there with my friends who are making who I make music with. Um, and just kind of start pushing on the music front, just like keep putting stuff out and like put it out more frequently and not have to sit on things for two years because I'm in school and I don't have time right. or resources. Um, but yeah, I got offered some not so great deals this summer, just like money wise. They were wonderful people, but it, not enough for me to like drop out of school. So I guess I'm just kind of waiting for a sign but also, uh, there's no way I'm staying in school after this year. Um, I'm going to L.A. That's my plan. Good going to L.A. I'm going to go <laughs> make go my make dream <laughs> come true in L.A., even though I'm already in New York. But, you know. Why sign a deal if we're continuing to release things independently? I would like some structure. Mm -hmm. I would like some people to tell me this album should be done by this date and it should have this many songs and... I would like to say that I, I can do it all by myself and I have been doing it by myself, but it's exhausting and it's hard and it requires a lot of brain power and a lot of focus and organization. Yeah. And I am not organized <laughs> and I am not focused. <laughs> and I think, I mean, it, it, could, it could be in a different light. Like it could just be a manager that's like helping me figure these things out. Um, also, I just need some money. I don't have money. 
So <laughs> yeah, that always helps. Yeah. <laughs> Where can people find your music? Spotify, Apple Music, all of the streaming services. There's some stuff on Bandcamp. And you can go on TikTok and listen to my clips and Instagram. But yeah, that's where it all is. Awesome. Sweet. I'm so excited for the EP to come out. And that's all my questions I have for Amazing. You. So many questions. So many great questions. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you for taking the bus to be on over to New Jersey to be here, Gabby. Go check out Daffo Stuff everywhere you can listen to music. They've got an EP coming out October 20th. And subscribe to American Musical Supply for more artist content like this.